All right. Um, I think we have a critical mass here, so we will get started. Um, again, my name is Kristen Kraft from the Silicon Valley Bank team, and Kyle and I are really excited to be here with you today talking about how to build an investor deck that gets you the right meetings. Um, so a little bit of um, context setting. We see ourselves at, at Silicon Valley Bank um, as sitting sort of in the middle of a bunch of different circles on this Venn diagram. Um, we bank a majority of venture-backed startups. Um, here in New England, we bank about 70% of venture-backed startups. And then we also bank about 75% of VCs um, and then work closely with many other ecosystem partners. And the reason I call this out is because our goal is to increase your chance of success. We want to stack the deck in your favor um, and help you succeed, whether it's with your investor pitch deck or with your fundraising strategy or your go-to-market strategy or an introduction to a top lawyer or fractional CFO. Um, and consequently, we're always looking for incredible experts who can help lend advice and lend their perspective on common founder challenges and opportunities. So my own background is in startups. I'm an erstwhile founder and then longtime operator um, coming from a marketing background in B2B SaaS companies. Um, and I will let Kyle introduce himself because he is one of these cherished ecosystem partners that is super expert in his domain. Um, and we're so grateful to have him here lending that expertise to this topic. Um, Kyle, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you for having me, Kristen. So been a longtime partner of SVB. Actually, um, I helped build a company up here in New Hampshire. Uh, called Dine. Um, that was a, a very happy SVB client for many, many years. Uh, and I've just stayed in great touch and, and collaborated with the SVB team over those years. Uh, so, you know, I think in York IE, what we've basically built is what we call a vertically integrated strategic growth and investment firm for technology companies. So our core operating business is an advisory as a service business where we help companies with everything from product development uh, to go to market and rev ops, to fp &A, uh, to marketing and communications. And then we also are an early stage seed investor. So we uh, manage a captive capital pool of about $20 million per year uh, that we invest in 15 to 20 B2B SaaS startups every year. So, uh, you know, our, our reach, you know, we have a very large community. We partner with companies like SVB, the other VCs in the ecosystem, other service providers, and, you know, are talking to thousands and thousands and thousands of founders, operators, uh, startup team members, every single day. So we're, we're, we're really uh, kind of taking a lot of those learnings and trying to give back to the ecosystem through resources and honestly doing things like this with, with you people. So we're really excited to be here. Awesome. Well, can't wait to let everybody hear um, your best practices, strategies, and, and, and must-haves. Um, so a little bit of context here about why investor alignment matters. Um, certainly during trickier economic times, let's say, it's tempting to sort of be like, well, why would you even question it? Like anyone who's willing to give you any amount of money, like you should take it. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, first of all, you're not going to have people, um, you know, it, either you have a, a sort of strong company with the right fundamentals, and therefore you may have your pick, um, or you may not. Um, and so that alignment really matters. Um, but I think even more importantly, it's about how you spend your time. As a founder, time and energy, like they are your most precious assets. Um, and so the way that you deploy your time and your energy matters tremendously. You don't want to waste your time talking with investors who are not going to say no to you, sorry, who are not going to say yes to you um, and who don't align. Um, so Kyle, you and I were talking about this the other day. Many of these pieces come from you. Um, will you add a little bit more context and color to some of the pieces here um, that you highlighted in terms of why this investor alignment matters so much? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I think first and foremost, for every founder on the phone, you know, we spend so much time when we're founding startups and building out the original founding ownership structure between like which founders get what amount of equity and how much are we going to put in an option pool for employees. But then oftentimes we just go out and sell a small piece of our company to an investor, right? And I think what people need to realize more, more so now than ever in this macro economy is that you know, when you raise money from outside investors, you're selling a little bitty, bitty piece of your company to a bank. And you need to make sure that those now new business partners on your cap table are, are folks that you're super aligned with. That starts at the firm level and making sure that the thesis of the firm matches, but that also 
gets to the individual on the personal level, the managing partners, the principals, the analysts at the investment firms that you're working with, or the angel investors you're raising from, or the family offices you're raising from, that you have the same perspectives and philosophies on how to build and grow a company. Because once you start partnering with one investor or two investors or five investors, that's also going to lead to uh, other investors who are looking at you kind of pattern mapping to see, oh, is, uh, is that a similar like investor to me? And should I be looking at this company and being a part of it, right? So I think it's really important to kind of just make sure that that philosophy match is there, uh, the personal relationship matches there, the communication matches there. And that gets like, before you ever even get into the company you're building and what you're doing and what market space you're in. I love it. Um, and I know that uh, when we were chatting the other day, Kyle, you had some really incredible, like specific questions to ask to, to get at some of these pieces. So we will come to that in just a moment. Um, I did note a lot, number of people saying that the chat was disabled. I think you should be able to add questions that are there now. So thank you for, for letting us know and for bearing with us for a sec there. Um, let us turn our attention now um, to how you can look for investor alignment. Um, I think there are some basics, some things that um, perhaps you know about already. Um, and then there are some things that are perhaps not so intuitive, more nuanced items. Um, but a, a lot of this, um, and Kyle, I'll let you share some color on how to think about this, how to go about this. But at SVB, um, you know, we talk a lot about like doing your research early and building a really wide funnel of potential investors, um, and then whittling it down. Um, doing this due diligence matters a lot. And I can't tell you how often, you know, I, I um, often am co-hosting the fundraising workshop alongside VCs who talk about the fact that they get, you know, for every one qualified email they get from a founder, they get like 10 emails from people who are obviously not a fit for them um, because that founder is raising a pre-seed round and this investor only invests series B and above. Um, or, you know, I mean, that's related to check size. Um, or potentially like that VC is focused just on climate tech. And they have somebody who, who's out there building a consumer product for, um, you know, children and families, like not, not, not a fit there in terms of industry. Um, so I think that it's, it's worth doing your, your homework ahead of time um, and being really, really systematic, being really intentional um, about how you are researching and seeking out investors. Um, all of this information, by the way, is on any investor's um, website. Um, in fact, most investors like are very, very bullish about putting um, their, their priorities, their preferences, their areas of expertise on their website because they want to make sure that they are drawing, it, drawing in the right founders who fit um, their portfolio and their portfolio's goals. Um, one final piece here is around competition. You know, ideally you want to find investors who um, are focused on the industry that you are in. Uh, however, generally speaking, most investors get a little bit, um, you know, leery of making investments that are, um, you know, too similar to a company in which they already have an investment. Um, Kyle, will you share with us a little bit of your perspective? Like, is this something that you see on the investment side at York? Um, people sort of like reaching out, what's sort of the best that you've seen? And then what do you see that's not so great in terms of people doing that research in advance on the basics? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll give you both angles of it. I mean, on the investor side, we see over 150 inbound investment inquiries a month where companies are asking to pitch us for investment. I can tell you right away, you can lop off probably half of that immediately that's out of thesis. And thesis is right on our website, right? In five places. Uh, so it's you know pretty straightforward there. On the, on the founder side of it, I can't tell you how many times I've reviewed an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet on investor outreach programs. And it's just a spray and pray mindset. And I think one thing you need to remember when you are running a fundraise process is Treat it more like a good sales process, right? Uh, you're going to be prospecting investors. Remember, you're the free agent. You're trying to sell them what you do and why you're a good fit for them. Well, it's no different than in your company, not going to your ideal customer profile or your ICP. Um, if you're reaching out to people who aren't going to buy from you, then why would you ever do the same in the investment community, right? So I think it's just important that you hone in. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about research. I saw someone put signal at nfx.com to use as a resource. Um, but there's lots of different ways you can just get a lot more 
a lot smarter and there's lots of platforms and, and just tools to get the context right too when you do get on the phone with those potential investors to make sure that you're truly aligned with them. Awesome. So many great, um, you know, points and suggestions coming here and, and an appetite for resources that let you do your homework. I love the mindset that everybody is in. Thank you. Well, one thing actually too, um, York uh, IE has, I'll put one in here right now. We have a platform that we originally built for ourselves called Fuel, which was a data automation and market research plat platform for private companies. So it's a free platform similar to PitchBook Crunchbase. But what we've also done is added a lot of operational advisory templates and playbooks to actually help you run and operate your company, live chat with us to get more advice and feedback. Uh, that could also be another another tool in your toolbox for this as well. I love it. And, you know, I will say like, I talk with um, founders, sometimes not SVB clients because SVB clients are too smart for this, but, you know, I, I'm occasionally, I hear from, from founders who are like, oh, I just don't have the time. It's like faster and easier for me to take this spray and pray approach. Um, but really it's not like, I mean, I'm going to sound like my dad for a moment here. Um, but, you know, I think like, preparation is oftentimes like you should be spending the majority of your time on that preparation because it makes you so much more efficient on the back end and a lot more successful, quite honestly. Yeah. And honestly, you're, you're talking about a pitch deck, like your pitch deck also better talk to the points of the thesis of your investor, right? So, so again, if all of a sudden you're showing a pitch deck, you made a good point on climate tech, Kristen, and then you're presenting ed tech to a climate tech investor, then you're completely irrelevant too. So you're just kind of wasting everybody's time. You know, again, I come from a sales background. My first jobs were BDR, you know, ladder climb through sales. And the number one thing you learn the hard way in sales and being a salesperson is not to waste your time on people who aren't going to buy from you. And it's kind of no different when it comes to fundraising strategies and processes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, could not agree more. And I think, um, you know, those pieces of doing your homework are um, not easy per se, but like relatively straightforward. Um, there are, there's a whole other category of things to look for when it comes to investor alignment that might not be as obvious. Um, and, and some of these nuances include the philosophy of the investment firm, of the team. Um, you know, I'm going to let Kyle speak to this because he has some really incredible um, points when we were talking the other day about pragmatism, about how uh, an investor thinks about growth and how you think about, you know, questions to ask yourself about what type of growth you want to see for your business and making sure those things are aligned. There are a lot of value adds that um, your investors can bring to the table from advice to introductions um, to helping with key hires, to even helping with, um, you know, those initial um, sort of customers that you're trying to land and use as your, your, your flagship customers. Um, and then last, you know, do you want to be a small fish in a massive pond or is it more strategic to be a bigger fish in a smaller pond? I, I think that it can feel um, exciting, enticing to um, seek out investment from like the biggest name investor out there. But especially if you're early days, um, you know, or you're one of their sort of smaller companies, like you might not get a ton of attention. So Kyle, do you mind sharing um, your perspective on this? Especially like I thought your, your thoughts around philosophy and pragmatism were so astute the other day, really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, like, you know, the, the large tier one funds are now multi-billion dollar funds. So for those funds to deploy in startups, they need to be participating in large rounds and they need to be writing large checks in those large rounds. So whenever you see a multi-billion dollar fund investing 250K in seed checks, just do the math. You are, you are less than a percentage point of their overall capital being deployed, which means that until you get to some level of scale, you might not be that important to them. So I think that's a good kind of context setter of like, yeah, make sure the tier one, tier one's really value add to have, because otherwise they're kind of just um, seeding you until later. Right. I think on the philosophy, pragmatism, this is just sort of like what type of company are you trying to build? You know, I think we've gotten a Silicon Valley culture of growth at all costs, uh, burning a lot of money, uh, getting valuations that are 10, 20, 30, 50 times your ARR. I think I saw a stat the other day, it ballooned to like some companies were getting 115 X during the pandemic on their ARR. I mean, these are these are metrics you've got to remember. You then need to go grow your revenue to and sustain to ever get a return on your company someday, right? So I think there's just a pragmatism around growth. There's an alignment 
on um, valuation, on terms, on structure, on governance, on pace of growth. Um, that's what we mean about pragmatism, right? Like, like, do you actually believe not just in your top-down goals that you put in your pitch deck, but in the supporting financial models, the bottoms up? How many new customers do I need to add at this dollar value per customer? Can I actually achieve these milestones to unlock the next stage of growth, right? These, these are the types of things that we mean around pragmatism. When it gets to value add, you know, every investor says they're a value add investor. But what I think you really need to do, is you know, look at what they actually do. So again, remembering that you're the free agent, that you're the bell of the ball, that you're the independent company looking for capital, operate that way. You know, talk to their customers, uh, talk to, you know, past portfolio companies, uh, talk to companies at the right stage at the same time when they invested and, and get the feedback. Reference your investors no different than they're referencing you and talking to your customers to validate the opportunity. So I think these are just a bunch of the things that I'd really, I'd really stress. Um, again, it's more about trying to put the power back in the hands of founders uh, to be in control of their own destiny, preserve optionality for exit, for next rounds, for IPO, whatever destiny you have, uh, try to control that the best you can. And, and that only works if you're aligned with the right types of investors. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, getting down to brass tacks about how you can think about, um, about how you can think about um, digging into some of these, especially these more nuanced pieces. Um, Kyle, I know a lot of these came from you in terms of how to um, really dig a layer deeper um, and, and sort of ask some of the questions that most founders don't tend to ask. Um, do you mind sharing, um, you know, I think the, the sort of research piece, like follow an investor on Twitter, like read what they're posting on LinkedIn. If they have blog, the blog posts that they've published on um, their firm's blog, like read those. Um, how about this, this second category of other areas to dig into? Um, do you mind sort of sharing your perspective on those? Yeah, sure. I mean, I've always operated my career with this mantra, and it goes back to being an SDR or an intern, even of trying to be the most prepared person in the room, right? Again, part of this comes from the, the sales and marketing background and trying to put yourself in the shoes of the buyer on the other end of the line. And, and a lot of that's about context, right? Like, how do you set context? How do you how do you create icebreakers to develop a relationship right when you get on the horn? And part of that is to be able to say, oh, I saw a great tweet you had, or I read your, your LinkedIn post you put up a few weeks ago, or I followed your blog on pragmatic scaling, Kyle. And guess what? We have a pragmatic scaling strategy, right? So we talked about it a little bit earlier. These are just some of the free things you can do that don't take a ton of time, that are just thoughtful ways for you to get to know investors, their firms, um, follow along long before you're ever even fundraising, but that certainly set you up to get on the call and, and be prepared. Um, we mentioned other tools like PitchBook, like Crunchbase, like um, Signal, um, like Fuel, uh, which is fuel.yorkie at our website. Um, there's loads of different tools, Owler, Tracks, and I can go on and on and on where you can you know, study both competitors, comparators, and study the venture ecosystem. So leverage these things though, and really find that time to be the most prepared person in the room. You don't need to be the smartest in the room, but being the most prepared about the situation that you're going to be in. I also think, I mean, I, I can scream through the rooftops. York IE is almost 100 people now. And I can tell you, if you talk to some of the largest VCs, traditional venture firms in the world, they do not have that resource bench. And so we've been building out a resource bench from the value add perspective that we can provide advisory capabilities to any startup at any stage of growth. We do not need to be an investor. So think of it almost like a modern McKinsey for your startup with a capital arm. That's our unique value add to the market right? That does not mean that every other firm is going to have that unique value add. They'll have some other slant of value out in the market. So again, make sure you understand that, right? All of these things also play into the macro market and the macro economy right now, right? The game has actually sort of changed. I see some questions here on, you know, West Coast, East Coast, Silicon Valley, Northeast, um, I think the Northeast and the East Coast has always had a little bit more of the you know, valuation sensitivity, um, the, the, the focus on you know, uh, burn rates being de minimis, being thoughtful about banking partners like ones with SVB for non-dilutive capital. I think I always talk about the Silicon Valley kind of growth at all costs construct. And honestly, that was rewarded for many, many, many years. And even now, companies are still getting great multiples on their on their ARR and on their run rates. So 
let's not be fooled by the last few years of like really ridiculous valuations. The valuations are still pretty damn good if you think about it in context. Um, so again, these are just some different things. I also think like remembering that you're also interviewing this new shareholder of your company when you're raising money is super important. Like, so I'm trying to understand how they operate in the tough times. What do they do when you're not doing well? How do they approach situations or there's co-founder conflict or a, a big customer churns or where you're running close to your runway? Like, how do you deal with those types of things? I think that's really, really important and, and worth asking. Um, by the way, ARR, I saw a question is annual recurring revenue. Um, it's a SaaS metric for software companies that are recurring revenue, but it's you can kind of equate it to like your this month's revenue times 12 as your run rate in some instances. That's great. Um, just like a quick anecdote, um, one of my sort of alma maters, um, the startup, I guess no longer a startup, but the video hosting company Wissia, where you know our former companies um used to oh. team up together on a lot. Um, but when I was at Wistia, which is a B2B SaaS company, um, Wistia was mostly bootstrapped. There were some investors, um, but Wistia has always been very focused on, um, you know, a, a sane pace of growth, not the whole growth at all cost perspective. Um, and occasionally because Wistia had really great revenue metrics, um, you know, really strong profitability, we would get courted by investors. Um, and it was interesting how clear it became like pretty early into the conversation um, that, that when there was a disconnect between the investor's perspective on growth at all costs and Wistia's preference for sane, sustainable growth, work-life balance, um, you know, culture, um, you know, so often like, I mean, Kyle, I'm curious if you've seen this as well, but like, quite honestly, oftentimes um, growth at all costs happens at the expense of culture. It is really, really hard to instill common values in your team when your team is doubling in size like every month. Like you don't have you don't have the sort of longevity and perspective among your team to build and maintain the kind of culture that you're trying to build. Um, so you know, back to, to Kyle's points about um pragmatism around growth. Uh from my perspective, like from the startup world and also now working with 800 startups here in New England, like this seems to be one of the biggest points of friction. Um, and it feels scary to ask about, um, you know, I know it can feel uncomfortable to, to have this conversation with an investor who you desperately want to invest in your company um, and to ask them hard questions about like, hey, like, honestly, like, are you going to be pushing me to grow faster than I want? Like, do you realize that actually culture is super important to me? And I'd rather build a team and a culture that's going to, you know, still be around and that people are going to love five years from now, um, even if sometimes that's at the expense of growth. Um, again, it can be uncomfortable, but better to ask those questions now yeah. than regret it in the future. Kristen, we share in that story, Chris Savage, your founder, CEO, and our, our leadership team, we used to always collaborate on this. I mean, we scaled our business to 30 million ARR before we raised outside capital. Now that took a lot longer and we had to be aligned on that as a leadership team, that that was the right approach. But then when it came time to raise money, actually we saw a little bit of the, op the, the other side of that, which was a lot of private equity investors and growth equity investors actually want the same level of um, you know, growth at all costs. They want it profit at all costs. And then all of a sudden now it's like you're, you're needing to cut mission critical things to maintain some level of growth just to get the profitability. So I think it's a balancing act of like, you have the bookends of like kind of private equity mindset and there can be private equity investors who are coming earlier and earlier now, making sure that they're not too ruthless about how to run, run and operate the company. And the other side, the sort of growth at all costs, like, you know, play for play for the end game. I mean, not every company needs to be a unicorn people, right? Like, I mean, some of the best founders I've ever met have had $10 million exits, $25 million exits, $100 million exits. And guess what? They're super successful and rich, you know, and their teams have the reward and experience from an amazing, amazing journey. And some of those companies didn't take, you know, five to seven years. They took 10 to 15 to 20 or still operating. These are all good companies. So like, let's make sure to celebrate all that. We in 
we in sort of like tech startup fundraising land get sort of like hung up in all of this, but everyone outside this space thinks it's nuts how much venture capital money is out there and how fast we try to go and how much money we burn to get there. So I, again, I just think like, again, I grew up in a small family business. Maybe it's like rooted in that. Maybe it's rooted in Dine's bootstrap story. Maybe it's rooted in bootstrapping York IE. But these are the types of things I, I get on my soapbox on a lot because I just feel like people try to do what everyone else is do. Do you, do what's right for you and make sure you find the right partners to do it with. Yeah, I love that. That's such a good a good point. Like literally any priority that you think is right for you, like is great. Um, just like be very explicit about that. I spoke at a panel at UMass the other night and, and the woman interviewing me at a, a couple million dollar revenue startup, really, really talented young founder, mid twenties. And she's like, so I keep on getting told that I need to go raise $15 million. Do you think I should raise $15 million? And I was like, I know nothing about your business. I don't know about any of your, your current capital needs, your profitability, your gross margins. I don't know anything about any of your expense profiles. Like I have no idea if you need to raise zero or 50, right? Um, and I think sometimes people give like advice, like blanket advice. And just remember you are a unique snowflake. There are patterns to map towards, but you are gonna be your own unique um, business that's built off the philosophy of your, of your leadership. Yeah, totally agree. Um, so, um, you know, a few kind of just table stakes items to keep in mind. We touched on these already a bit. Um, but as you are thinking about, um, qualifying investors, again, like think of this as a sales funnel. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're checking the box on each of these pieces, um, as you are doing your research, ideally you are building a spreadsheet and going through it line by line, um, and getting really specific and really diligent, um, about alignment with investors on all of these parameters, um, in addition to all of those more nuanced pieces. Um, and just to take us home, um, you know, also a few other pieces. Um, you want to make sure that you're clarifying the story, why you um, sharing your origin story, as well as the change you hope to see in the world. Uh, you know, investors love a story. They love passion. Like, let that shine through. Practice it with everyone you know. Make sure also that you're really realistic with the data. Um, I, 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 I get nervous for people when I see these, like, you know, TAMs, like total addressable market um, equations that are just so gigantic. Um, be realistic here um, and also share those early success metrics. Um, and then last but not least, um, the presentation matters as well. You know, having spending a small amount of money to make your deck look nice um, is generally quite worth it and will pay off in the long run. Um, I can't tell you how many pitch decks I see from founders um, where just sort of the basic like aesthetic is not there. Um, do yourself a favor, uh, you know, those kinds of things, they do matter um, to make, make life easier. For hey, Kristen, you. I did just drop in there. It's simple. It's just a tweet from me. I pinned it on my profile. Like, like don't overthink your investor deck, get a 50 inside deck. Yes, it's got to look good with the story arc and the framing. And you got to answer the questions that an investor wants to hear from you or needs to hear from you. You got to also remember so many times you're never even getting the chance to show it to them. You're just sending in an email follow-up after a conversation or after a lunch. So you need to be able to make sure it explains everything. So just give that a look. We have templates on the fuel platform too, but I think that would just be a very simple thing to, to keep and remember when you're creating your deck as well. A hundred percent. Um, and then keep in mind, like, just as you are doing your research on investors, they're doing their research on you. Um, so make sure that you are telling your story in the way that you want. Um, write a blog post about that origin story. Um, use a video to share that vision and share that passion. Um, and consider sending that, that video to folks before you go in to meet them in person or sharing that on social so that it's easy for them, for investors to find when they're researching. Um, be really active on Twitter, on LinkedIn um, to help build your brand and attract the right people. Um, I know we're at time, but, um, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, um, you know, for all of you on this webinar who are SVB clients, thank you so much. We love supporting you. Um, please take advantage of all of these elements here. For those of you who are not SVB clients, um, we would love to help you with so much. Um, we have 
excellent banking products, 4.33% uh, interest rate, which is 30 times the national average right now. Um, and then there is so much more that we do be above and beyond that in terms of access to VCs. Again, given that we bank a majority of investors, um, we can do a lot to put founders and investors in the same room together. We also help founders with a lot of, of practice, um, you know, doing those pitch sessions, refining that pitch deck. Um, giving strategy, connecting you with amazing experts and, and people like the folks at York IE, um, as well as individual founder success efforts, whether it's around fundraising or go-to-market strategy, um, talent acquisition, in addition to various ways to help you extend your, your runway um, with discounts, freebies um, from our partner. Huge thanks, Kyle, for joining me today. This was so much fun. Um, we'll be sharing this afterwards. So um, if you want to share this recording with anybody, please do. Um, and thank you and have a great rest of your day.